I was actually livid when I read this. I was, whew, I was so angry. I, I can't even I hate him. Hi everybody, how are you? I hope you're very, very well. How are you? I feel like I've not been here in ages. I wanna know how you're all doing, so let me know in the comments what you've been up to. I do want to quickly say before I start this video that I will be talking about some sensitive topics that you might find uncomfortable or triggering. I will censor as much as I can, but those topics will still be discussed, so if that's something that might make you feel a little bit uncomfortable, then this might not be the video for you. So just a little pre-warning. Also, for legal reasons, Reasons. Everything I say in this video is alleged. Nothing has been proven in a court of law. Let it just be known, I personally stand fully with the survivors, but we all know that our good old pal Scott Rudin is, is pretty litigious, so everything's alleged. Yeah. I'm sure that you probably have heard of some of the allegations against Scott Rudin, who is a Broadway producer, and just some general big changes that have been happening within the Broadway community. And I've had a few messages and comments and stuff saying, please do talk about this. And to be honest, it's been moving so quickly that I've been hesitant to talk about it before now. I wanted to make sure that basically like, I had a really good grip of what I was saying because I didn't want to just come on like, this is happening, but we don't really know what it means. And I mean, it is still developing but it's slowed down a little bit so I thought now is probably a good time to do a video on it but I'm sure as things happen I'll probably do more as well. So in this video I want to explain who Scott Rudin is, why Karen Olivo has left Moulin Rouge and what is happening with the music man. I will share all of the articles that I kind of got my information from down below in the description box. I do also want to give a massive shout out to Onstage Blog. It's a theatre news website and and they are so active with really taking a stand against the issues with and with all of the kind of corruption within Broadway and really just being totally honest. Onstage Blog's Twitter page has been just so helpful when I was trying to kind of figure out a timeline so I wanted to give a massive shout out to Chris at Onstage Blog. When this all first came out and major mainstream media wasn't covering it, Chris and Onstage Blog was covering it the whole time so it's a great place for very up-to-date news in the theatre world but it's like very non-biased which is great. So before about a month ago, I'd heard Scott Rudin's name as a producer in the same way that I knew Harvey Weinstein's name. I didn't know that Harvey Weinstein did what he did in the same way that I didn't know that Scott Rudin did what he did. But I very much knew his name. The only way that I had ever had more than just a name of Scott Rudin was basically one of my friend's sons was cast in a UK, I think it was a touring production of To Kill a Mockingbird, completely different than the Aaron Sorkin version that Scott Scott Rudin was producing for Broadway and basically they got a lawsuit from Scott Rudin saying that this small UK touring production was going to take money from his Broadway production. It was completely different. It wasn't the same in any way other than the specific text. And so my friend's son was in that production and right before they were due to start, they had to cancel the show because they couldn't afford to go up against this like massive heavy weight. And I remember thinking at the time like, you are ridiculous. And it must be said that his production of To Kill a Mockingbird at this time, it was taken in about $1.5 million a week. I feel like he didn't need to sue some small production in the UK because they would apparently take money from his ridiculous. It just kind of shows the type of person that he is. So basically on April 7th, The Hollywood Reporter released an article detailing the experiences and accounts of multiple staffers and assistants of Scott Rudin, detailing years and years of mental, physical and emotional in the workplace. They detailed things like a laptop being smashed on somebody's hand because they couldn't book Scott Rudin onto a fully booked flight and the assistant in question had to go to hospital. People having panic attacks, people working 14 hour days every day, being berated for absolutely no reason, and things thrown at them, and this just incredibly toxic atmosphere. I can't even begin to imagine the experience 
experience of being in a work environment like that 14 hours a day the thing is that people subject themselves to this because they think oh well I work at this production company and then it's something great on my CV and I can move on to do something else and it's like it happens time and time again it makes me so sad of all of the people who wanted to work in the movie or theatre business and apparently he would have all of these assistants like right out of college always under the age of about 25 and you know this would be somebody's first big job they would end up giving up because they think well this is the top production company and this is how I'm being treated so people end up leaving the business Kevin Graham Queso who was an assistant for Scott Rudin after he left he began therapy for people from the emotional and physical abuse that he received when he worked in Rudin's office. Last year he committed suicide and with Kevin's friends and family citing the abuse that he received at the hands of Scott Rudin as being a key part of his mental health issues and his subsequent death. It mentioned in the article how the 1994 film Swimming with Sharks, which is a revenge fantasy for an assistant to their boss, was actually based around Scott Rudin and his infamous inability to keep an assistant. He boasted in an article that he went through over 115 assistants within a five year span. And you might think, well, maybe he's got this massive office. That doesn't seem like that much. But when you realize that his team is around 10 people, that's massive that many people within a five year span. It's unbelievable that, that this was able to go on for so long and people just knew about it and they just, you know, just looked past it. And Scott Rudin's excuse when he boasted about how many assistants he went through, he would say, well, you know, the good ones, they would move on quickly and go on to great careers and the bad ones, well, they'd drop out and never be heard from again. And it's like, so if you weren't tough enough to deal with the, the abuse, from Scott Rudin, he was fine with basically squashing someone's career goals and aspirations. It makes me sick. It actually makes me sick. Can you even just imagine as well, 14 hour days, like that's 14 hour days in the office. So you would be expected to get to the office for 6am and no one would leave until like 8pm at night. Obviously you would have press things to go to. You would then be phoned at any time of the night and on the weekends. It's like an all, I can't even imagine the stress and the trauma that those people must have gone through and that they must be having to process when you're out of a situation like that. I just, I can't even imagine it. I can't. The thing is a lot of people, once they left as well, there are examples of Scott Rudin going onto IMDB, which is the internet movie database, and he would remove people's credits that they'd amassed when they worked for him. And he'd also require staff to sign non-disparagement agreements. It's a lot like a non-disclosure agreement where basically when you work for him you're not allowed to say he was an abuser you're not allowed to go out and talk about that I could go on citing example after example because honestly the Hollywood Reporter did a great article and then Vulture did an amazing one as well which I will leave both down below and I think that you don't want to hear their accounts and experiences all alleged obviously through me so I will leave the links to those articles down below so that you can take the time to read those for yourself so after the Hollywood Reporter article came out, I'm sure that you're thinking, well, it'll just be like the Harvey Weinstein one and mainstream media would be covering it and there would be a huge outcry for this to stop. And to be honest, nothing really happened. Apparently some writers for popular publications wanted to cover it, then went to their editors at a big magazine, big theatre website, and they had to have names taken out or the whole article was scrapped. So that's why a lot of things aren't covered in the mainstream media. I mean, the thing is with theatre specifically, the relationship between New York theatre writers and production companies is so incredibly intertwined. And if a publication starts talking badly about a producer, it's essentially going to take away the producer's money, which is then going to take away the publication's money. Money. and it's all at the end of the day first and foremost Broadway is a business and I don't think you realize that until it comes to situations like this when you realize that money is just the beginning and end of it all really in the Broadway machine money makes the Broadway world go round what I will say as well obviously I mentioned on stage blog at the beginning but right after the Hollywood Reporter article came out 
nobody was really talking about it in mainstream media but there were bloggers and theatre websites who were talking about it who maybe aren't like the mainstream ones. I think sometimes people can look down on online blogging and blogger reporting as though it's not as valid or as important or to be taken seriously and I think that, I think it's really wrong actually because I really do believe that if people like Chris at Onstage Blog and his team weren't so vocal. In Chris's first article that he wrote when the Hollywood Reporter article came out he said the way Harvey Weinstein was eliminated from the Hollywood elite proves it can be done to folks like Scott Rudin but it shouldn't take serial rape for organizations to do the bare minimum to take a stand or keep their members safe. Straight away, calling for change. And I totally agree. I think that people weren't taking it seriously at first because the people who were being used were assistants. If it's not a celebrity that we think, oh, how could that happen to them? Do we not care? Or it wasn't sexual assault. So maybe it wasn't as serious, which is complete rubbish. All abuse should be taken with the utmost importance. But thank God for the internet and the people out there who weren't willing to let this slide. Slowly but surely, more people started to feel comfortable with stating how they felt about the situation, with sharing their own stories as well, and standing with the survivors. A small group of actors and industry professionals were talking about this straight away, but it was a small group. I do want to give like a call to Patty Murray, Anthony Rapp, Telly Lung, Eden Espinosa, and others who were straight away like. Like, this needs to change because it's hard to do and then on the 12th of April Karen Olivo from In the Heights, West Side Story, Hamilton was due to return to the leading role of Satine in Moulin Rouge. On the 12th of April Karen Olivo resigned and made a public announcement that they would not be returning to Moulin Rouge. She was basically saying I could make a lot of money being in Moulin Rouge but I value humanity and the people around me and the community around me more than I value that paycheck. They were saying that until Scott Rudin is held accountable, until the systemic racism and bullying and the abuse of power on actors, creatives, everybody within the industry, that they won't be returning to Broadway. I mean this is huge. I just have the utmost respect for them, for their strength and support for victims. Some people have said, oh but Scott Rudin isn't a producer on Moulin Rouge, what is this change going to do? And I think the fact that people still think that that's what it's all about is part of the issue. Karen Olivo is saying this Scott Rudin situation is awful but this is time when we all have a moment to take a step back from the community and from the immediacy of theatre and say, wow we've got some time while well, Broadway is closed, let's do the work, let's make a change. And in a leading performer on Broadway to step back and say, I'm not going back until you make a change, is just humongous. And Karen is saying, I'm a name in this industry, I'm going to use that name to stand up for what I believe in, to tell other people who want to speak out, who maybe aren't brave enough yet or who aren't ready yet, that they can stand with me. Do you know what I mean? Broadway is a business and to take away its resources like its big name stars, change has to happen. And then finally after this massive step by Karen Olivo, more people started to talk and started to call out abuse they'd seen, address their own biases or ignorance regarding abuse that they'd seen and not um, stood up for. It is still disappointing to not see as many white A-list Broadway stars coming out and speaking because they are the people who kind of carry the most weight but any change is a start. Then there started to be a call for Sutton Foster and Hugh Jackman to say something or do something. So if you don't know, Scott Rudin is, was the producer of The Music Man which is supposed to be starting at the Winter Garden Theatre, the previous home of Beetlejuice and people realise that if Sutton Foster and Hugh Jackman, two massive stars, are across Broadway and Hollywood were to speak out and say I'm not doing this production until that man is put on the actors equity do not work list or until we see real change within the Broadway community regarding systemic racism and bullying 
things would change, it, they would have to. When you have a marquee as massive as is outside the Winter Garden with their names on it, and they say, I'm pulling if you're not gonna make changes, that would be massive. So a few days after Karen Olivo resigned from Moulin Rouge and people were starting to talk about it, Scott Rudin finally gave a very half-hearted apology for his behavior in the Washington Post on a Saturday morning. Mm. Like the thing is, in the Washington Post, if you're gonna release an apology, post it to a New York publication where the abuse has taken place. He also did it to a publication with a paywall. So again, not everybody can even see the apology. And the reason for that is that he doesn't care. He clearly doesn't care about what he's done if that's the way he apologized. The thing is that the apology that he gave was not for the victims, not for the people who have been abused, not for the survivors. It's for his investors and it's for his wealthy audience members. It was then announced that Scott Rudin would take a step back from his active roles within the Broadway community. So that would be against the music man. Sutton Foster then spoke. She basically said that she had privately said that she would refuse to continue on in the music man if Scott Rudin did not pull out from his active role as a producer. Basically this was in like an Instagram live that she did. And she said, I didn't feel like I needed to post it so that it would happen. I didn't feel like that was something I needed to do because it becomes like a reactionary thing. I needed to step back, make sure the decision I made was mine and not based on the noise of social media. To be honest, something about this just rubbed me up the wrong way. She also described the act of making the announcement on social media saying I'm not going to continue unless Scott Rudin is removed from the production. She described it as trumpeting and I don't know, for me it comes across as a little bit disrespectful for what Karen Olivo did of making a public statement. I did see a great TikTok on this by Catherine Quinn, I'll leave a link to it down below, where Catherine basically saying it's a privilege that you didn't feel the need to post what you wanted to say online because you just knew that people would listen to you. I do have to also say that I feel like Sutton Foster was at the time being given quite a lot of flack when actually Hugh Jackman is an even bigger name. He's higher up on the, the marquee at the Winter Garden Theatre. He's Oscar nominated and I do really think that Hugh Jackman should have been the one to first step up and say something because again he's a white male lead so if he was to drop out it would have been massive. They would have had to do something. And also also, Sutton describing it as like, I had to figure out how I felt. There, there were so many examples. There is no doubt in anyone's mind. Obviously, this is all alleged. It's so clear that these are very accurate, truthful examples given. The stories have been corroborated so many times. And then for someone to say, well, I needed to see how I felt about it. Do I actually believe? It's essentially saying, do I actually believe these people? Do you know what I mean? Maybe I'm too picky. I don't know. Which is like fair enough if you disagree, you know? Then on the 20th of April, A24, which is a film company that Rudin was connected to that produced like Lady Bird and other films, they then severed ties with Scott Rudin. Why did it take so long? The first article came out on the 7th of April and it took until the 20th for a production company to say, actually, maybe we shouldn't work with this person. I mean, like the power of social media is incredible, but also, come on, be better. <laughs> On the 21st of April, we finally got a statement from Hugh Jackman that was less than satisfactory, I would say. It was all in capitals, which I don't know, just seems weird to me. He also said that the most important voice we need to hear from right now is Scott Rudin. And we heard from him and he said sorry. <laughs> is that the person that we need to hear? Should it not be the survivors that we need to hear from the most to make sure that this doesn't happen again? I don't know, like I've always had kind of dodge vibes from him after the whole Jeremy Jordan greatest showman situation, which I talked about in a video, I'll leave it down below. But this was such a half-hearted statement. No stance on any of the other issues that completely plague the Broadway community and the toxic atmosphere. I was really disappointed with it. 
because I think Hugh Jackman, you could really, really make a change if you wanted to. You really could. Maybe it goes to show that when people aren't directly affected by something, maybe they just don't care. Then on the 22nd of April, there was the Broadway March. So this was a march led by industry professionals, actors, where they had a specific set of demands that they wanted from the Broadway community. They wanted a list of organisations that are specifically going to be targeting helping black, indigenous and people of colour within the theatre community to feel safer in the work environment. They wanted a report on equity dues and how they were spent within the last year because performers were still expected to pay equity dues this year. They're like, we've not worked, where's that money going? Demands for Scott Rudin to obviously be out of the Broadway League. Greater inclusion for deaf and disabled artists. Greater inclusion for trans and non-binary artists. I do think that there is a very big conversation that needs to be had at the moment about trans and non-binary representation and support within the theatre community, specifically around Priscilla, Jagged Little Pill and Bring It On. So I would like to do a video on that. If you're interested, let me know. The march was a massive success. I was so inspired by all the videos I saw. Eden Espinosa gave a great speech. It was amazing to see so many people out there and standing up for what they believe in. It was very like reaffirming in my heart. I wish I could have been there with everything in my soul. And then on April 23rd, Vulture released the article that I mentioned earlier that was incredible, like so in depth with even more examples and experiences of assistants who had worked for Scott Rudin. It really made me think about this like trope in media as well around the big boss who's able to treat everybody badly and they're seen as eccentric or this is just the way that people in high powerful jobs function and it's like no I feel like it's kind of been glamorized in media this very toxic work environment and it's so it's so wrong it's not how people deserve to be treated in the vulture article there was another statement from Scott which I will read out Scott has acknowledged and apologized for the troubling office interactions that he has had with colleagues over the years and has announced that he is stepping back from his professional work so that he can do the proper work to address these issues that said the stories you have cited, specifically herein, are in most cases extreme exaggerations, frequently anonymous, second and third hand examples of urban legend. What a bastard. So basically saying it's all made up anyway. It wasn't that bad. I was actually livid when I read this. I was, whew, I was so angry. I, I can't even... I hate him. And then on April 24th, Scott Rudin announced that he would be stepping down from the Broadway League himself. I mean, it would have been great for the Broadway League to make that move for him and show where they stand, but they let him do it himself. And that's pretty much where we are at the moment. I mean, as I say, it's still developing. New things are always happening. I feel like there's so much that's happened in the last couple of weeks. I've been a little bit overwhelmed by it. So hopefully this is a little bit more succinct and you're able to follow along with the story a little bit if you haven't been so sure what's going on. There is still so much to be done though. With other news, I know people who have worked in the West End specifically who've told me the most horrific stories from the treatment they've received from producers or people of power within the community and people are so afraid to come out and speak up and there's always people in power who will that, whether that be in whatever, Broadway, West End, regional theatre, community theatre, high school theatre, any facet of life, there's always going to be that. But specifically in theatre, I think that we are raised, we're conditioned to think, don't speak up, don't say how you feel. If you speak up, then you'll never be seen for an audition again. You're replaceable and nobody else is. And that's very much the idea and um, the sense that is built into us so much. You know, people see happen and people don't speak up because everyone's afraid and I just hope that this is the beginning of a change and I hope for a more inclusive and safer work environment for everyone involved in theatre across the world and somewhere that's 
more exciting for everybody. Because the best work isn't achieved when everyone's tense and stressed and upset and angry and tired and drained. The best work is when people are inspired and happy and open and excited. I would love to know your thoughts on what I've kind of covered today. Thank you so much for watching, I really do appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you next time. Love you lots, bye.